guys and welcome to How to Gastro. In today's video, we'll be talking about quite a well-known pathology around the world and that is colorectal cancer. So let's get started. So what is colorectal cancer? Colorectal cancer is a cancer that begins in the body's colon or the rectum. Cancer is the term used to describe the abnormal growth of cells which possess the ability to invade or spread to other parts of the body. So in my picture on the right, I just put in a basic diagram of the body's colon and we see that the colon is split into its different segments being the cecum, which is the first part of the colon, the ascending colon, we have the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon and the rectum. So colorectal cancer deals with any form of cancer that develops within these different segments of the colon. I also did a separate video on the cecal cancers so you guys can check that out but in this video, we'll focus on cancer of the ascending, transverse, descending, sigmoid, and rectal parts of the colon. So let's continue a bit further. So what are the causes of colorectal cancer? Most cases of colorectal cancer begin as small, non-cancerous, meaning benign, clumps of cells called adenomatous polyps. So if you guys checked out my video on the adenomatous polyps, you'll remember that we said this is a kind of polyp that develops within the colon and if left for a long period of time, it has the potential to become malignant. So over time, some of these polyps can become colon cancers. Risk factors include older age, male gender, a high intake of fat in the diet, alcohol, red meat, processed meats, obesity, smoking, and a lack of physical exercise. There are also a few inherited forms of colon cancer. The most common forms of genetically related colon cancer syndromes are hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer or HNPCC and HNPCC is also called Lynch syndrome and increases the risk of colon cancer and other cancers in the body. People with HNPCC tend to develop colon cancer before the age of 50. Another syndrome that is involved with the inherited forms of colon cancer includes FAP syndrome or familial adenomatous polyposis. And FAP is a rare disorder that causes one to develop thousands of polyps in the lining of the colon and rectum. And people with untreated FAP have a greatly increased risk of developing colon cancer before the age of 40. So if you look at my picture on the left, we have the FAP syndrome in which we have these thousands and thousands of tiny little polyps that develop within the colon and rectum. And these patients usually require resection of their affected segments. But if left unresected or untreated, it can go on to develop a colon cancer. So what are the signs and symptoms of colon cancer? The first thing the patient may notice is a change in the bowel habits and this may include bouts of diarrhea or bouts of constipation. They may also notice a change in the consistency of their stool and this is usually in the form of narrow streaking. So usually the consistency of their stool can become narrow bits of stool in comparison to the larger lumps that the patient is used to. And all this usually lasts longer than four weeks. The patient will also experience rectal bleeding or blood in the stool and this is usually a fresh bright blood and this is called hematochesia. They may also have persistent abdominal discomfort such as cramping, gas or pain, a feeling that the bowel isn't empty completely, weakness or fatigue and unexplained weight loss. So now that we know the basics of colon cancer, let's talk about the different types of cancer that can occur in the colon and rectum. The first one we'll talk about are the adenocarcinomas. Adenocarcinomas make up more than 95% of all colorectal cancers. This type of cancer starts in the cells that make mucus to lubricate the inside of the colon and rectum. Some subtypes of adenocarcinomas include the signet ring and mucinous carcinomas and they may have a worse prognosis. So the adenocarcinomas make up 95% of all colorectal cancers. So they are basically the majority of all colorectal cancers and they may have their own different subtypes. And in the picture below, we have an image of a colonoscopy view of an adenocarcinoma. And you can see how aggressive this tumor actually is. It's actually blocking the entire hollow tube. So it's caused a complete bowel obstruction because it's taken up the entire hollow space of the colon or this tube that stores the stool. 
And this patient will experience lots of constipation because the stool won't be able to pass through this area and the patient will need probably a holostomy in order to evacuate the fecal matter. Another type of tumor are the carcinoid tumors. The gastrointestinal carcinoid tumors form from a certain type of neuroendocrine cell, which is a type of cell that is a nerve cell and a hormone-making cell. Carcinoid tumors usually have a very slow growth rate and often don't cause any signs and symptoms until late in the disease. Another tumor that can affect the colorectal region are the gastrointestinal stromal tumors or the GISTs. These tumors start from specialized cells in the wall of the colon called the interstitial cells of Cargill. Some of these tumors may begin as non-cancerous clumps of cells, meaning that they are benign, and these tumors can also be found anywhere in the digestive tract and are usually not very commonly found in the colon. The next type of tumor we will talk about are the lymphomas. Lymphomas are cancers of the immune system cells that typically start in the body's lymph nodes, but they can start in the lymph systems of the colon, the rectum, and other organs within the body. And in my picture on the left, we have a right hemicolectomy specimen with a colonic lymphoma, and that has been cut open. So if you look closely, you see this tumor here that is developed in the right side of the colon, and the patient had to undergo a right hemicolectomy. The sarcomas. Sarcomas can start in the body's blood vessels, muscle layers, or, or other connective tissues in the wall of the colon and rectum. Sarcomas of the colon and rectum, however, are usually very rare. And in my picture on the left, we have a violaceous, slightly raised lesion, one of several found in the sigmoid colon of a 37-year-old man with an acquired immune deficiency syndrome. So these sarcomas are usually very common in patients who are very immune suppressed, and therefore they are common in patients with AIDS or patients undergoing chemotherapy or any form of treatment with immunosuppressants such as in autoimmune diseases, etc. So how can one diagnose a colon cancer? The first thing we can do is a stool test and this is in the form of a fecal occult blood test and here stool samples are checked for the signs of blood so usually our stool has no blood in it so the first thing we can do is check a stool sample for the presence of blood and that could indicate that there is something wrong in that area of the digestive tract. We can then do a colonoscopy and in this test the doctor inserts a small viewing tube all the way into the colon and looks for polyps or masses. We could do a flexible sigmoidoscopy and this test is like a colonoscopy except that the viewing tube is a lot shorter so the doctor can only look at the last portion of the colon which is called a sigmoid colon. So if you look at this diagram here, this is actually a colonoscopy that goes all the way, but a sigmoidoscopy has a similar viewing tube, but it's a lot shorter, and it ends somewhere around here. This is actually the sigmoid region of the colon, and that's as far as the sigmoidoscope can reach. Another test that we can use is a capsule endoscopy, and in this test, an ingestible camera-equipped capsule is swallowed and acts as a means of exploring the GI tract and can detect any colon irregularities. We could also do a stool DNA test, and in this test, we can detect mutant, fragmented, or methylated deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA, from exfoliated colon tumor cells in the stool. Blood tests. Blood tests are useful for measuring chemical compounds sometimes produced by colon cancers, such as the carcinoembryonic antigen, or CEA level. And this is usually increased in patients with colorectal cancer. The blood test can also be helpful in detecting anemia due to chronic blood loss in the stool. So patients who have cancer, their tumors tend to bleed out quite a bit and over time they can develop an anemia and the blood test can be helpful in checking for anemia as well. And finally, we could use a barium enema and these x-rays give the doctor a glimpse at the inside of the colon and rectum and it's another way to find polyps, tumors or other changes in the colon. Seen here in my picture on the right is a barium enema that shows the apple core tumor blocking the colon. So if you look at this image here, with this reddish arrow, you can see the apple core appearance. And that is basically due to that bile obstruction. The tumor is taking up this hollow tube and it's actually causing quite a significant obstruction of the bowel here. And we can see this apple core appearance on barium enema. 
So how can one stage a colon cancer? So before we get into the specifics of the staging of the disease, I just want to do a quick review of the layers that make up the colorectal wall. So if we look at this image above, we see the innermost layer, which is the mucosal layer. We then have the second layer, which is the submucosal layer. We then have a circular and then longitudinal layer, which make up collectively the muscular layer. And then we have the serous layer. So there's typically four main layers that make up this colon wall. So from innermost to outermost, we have the mucosal layer, the submucosal layer, the muscular layers, and the serosal layers. So that's something you need to keep in mind when we discuss the staging of colon cancer. So stage zero means that the cancer is found in the innermost lining of the colon or rectum. And that means if we look at this image down below, we see that stage zero basically means that the cancer is found within the mucosal layer or the innermost lining of the colon. Stage one means that the disease has grown into the muscular layer of the colon or rectum. So stage one means that this tumor has surpassed the mucosal layer and submucosal layers and has entered the muscular layer of the colon wall. Stage three means that the cancer has grown into or through the outermost layer of the colon or rectum. So stage three means that we have this tumor that is grown into the serosal layer or past it. So basically the tumor has passed all four layers of the colon wall. Stage three means that the cancer has spread to one or more lymph nodes in the area. So remember we have a lymph system that surrounds our bowel and stage three basically means that the tumor has passed the entire wall and has now started to invade the local lymph system. And stage four means that it has spread to other parts of the body such as the liver, lungs or bones. So stage four means that this tumor has become quite aggressive and is now spreading to other organs in the body. And this is what we call tumor metastasis. So now let's talk about the different treatment options we have in colorectal cancer. There are three primary treatment options that can be used. They are surgical treatment, chemotherapy treatment and radiation therapy. This slide will focus on the surgical treatment. The first surgical treatment option we'll talk about is removing polyps during a colonoscopy. If the cancer is small, localized and completely contained within a polyp and in a very early stage, it can be removed during colonoscopy by a process called a polypectomy. So if you look at my image here on the left above, we see this polypectomy. So basically this is a very quick form of surgical treatment and it's usually done during a colonoscopy. These polyps are resected during a process called a polypectomy. We could also do minimally invasive surgery. For polyps that can't be removed during a colonoscopy, they may be removed during a laparoscopic surgery. We could also do a partial colectomy and in this procedure the surgeon moves part of the colon that contains the cancer along with the margin of normal tissue on either side of the cancer. So if you look at this picture down below, say for example we have our tumor at the splenic flexure right here. So usually our surgeon will resect some healthy tissue on this side and healthy tissue on that side and usually these two bits of normal bowel are sewn back together. Surgery to create a way of waste to leave the body. When it is not possible to reconnect healthy portions of the colon or rectum, one will require a colostomy. This involves creating an opening in the wall of the abdomen from a portion of the remaining bowel for the elimination of stool into a bag that fits securely over the opening. So in patients where the healthy segments of the colon cannot be reattached, they will require the placement of a stoma for the evacuation of fecal matter. So now let's say a few words about the chemotherapy and radiation therapy options. Chemotherapy uses drugs to destroy cancer cells and chemotherapy for colon cancer is usually given after surgery if the cancer has spread to lymph nodes. In this way, chemotherapy may help reduce the risk of cancer recurrence and death from colon cancer. Radiation therapy uses powerful energy sources such as x-rays to kill cancer cells to shrink large tumors before an operation so that they can be removed more easily or to relieve symptoms of colon and rectal cancer. And finally, I just want to say a few words about the targeted drug therapy. Targeted cancer therapies are drugs or substances that block the growth and spread of cancer by interfering with specific molecules. Therefore, they are called molecular targets that are involved in growth, progression and the spread of cancer. The options available to patients with advanced colon cancer include bevacizumab, 
Cetuximab, Panitumumab, Ramichirumab, Rigoforinib, and Ziv, Aflibacept. And these are all molecular targeting drugs. And below here is a diagram of how these drugs actually work. So they interfere with different signaling pathways or they target specific molecules that are responsible for cell growth, angiogenesis, the proliferation and the survival of cancer cells. And in this way, they can actually prevent the progression of cancer in the body. And that brings us to the end of this video on colorectal cancer. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please make sure to like, comment, subscribe and share. I hope you found today's video very interesting and informative. If you'd like to download a copy of this presentation, you may do so by clicking the link in the description. Take care and bye for now.